Last week's sermon, Keith pointed out that a number of people who were spiritually blind had their eyes opened through the healing of a man who was physically blind. In the performing of that miracle, it was revealed that Jesus was God there among them in human form, and that changed everything. What does it mean for us to have our own spiritual blindness lifted? We're singing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. When we look to God and we recognize him for who he is, our perspective shifts. Tom is going to lead us in a song now that will help us to fix our eyes in the right place as we enter into the service today. the 
John 8, verse 31 to 32, Jesus says, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from what? <laughs> free from perspectives on life that actually lead down to dead ends. Free from a lot of things that hurt us. Free from the fear of dying. Free from an uncertain future free from many things, free to be who we were created to be. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come before you every day, every new morning, knowing that you know exactly what is ahead of us, knowing we can trust you. Lord, we would want to lay down now those things that have caused us to be blinded, to your truth, to your reality, as we have allowed fear, anxiety, uncertainty, anger, maybe even some unforgiveness to creep into our hearts. We would want to lay these things down before you now, asking that you would cleanse our minds and our hearts, that we would be able to see you more clearly and also be able to hear and receive what you would teach us today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hello and welcome to uh, the next sermon in our series during Lent. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 19 and verses 1 to 10, the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Luke writes these words. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save what was lost. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Send your Holy Spirit now Open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, our hearts to receive, that we might grow more into the likeness of Jesus. This we pray in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Recently, I heard this wonderful story about a mother and her four-year-old son, Joshua. 
For mum, it had been a trying day contending with Joshua's boisterous and challenging behaviour. He kept zooming around the house at a hundred miles an hour, grabbing everything within his reach, holding it in his hand and flying it uh, as though it were an aeroplane. If she asked him once, she asked him 20 times, Joshua, please don't play with that, you'll break it. Eventually, exhausted towards the end of the day, Mum sat down on the sitting room sofa just for five minutes respite. And you guessed it, she dozed off to sleep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Suddenly, she was awakened with a crash, bang, wallop sound coming from the kitchen. She dashed into the kitchen to find plates, cups, saucers, glasses smashed to smithereens on the floor. But there was no sign of Joshua. What had happened is, as Mum had dozed off, the very adventurous uh, Joshua had reached up onto the kitchen drainer. And he pulled the draining rack and an avalanche of crockery crashed onto the floor. Obviously startled and uh, knowing he'd misbehaved, he'd been disobedient, he uh, bolted and went into hiding. Eventually, Mum found Joshua upstairs, hiding in a wardrobe. It may make us smile, but this reminded me of the story of Adam and Eve at the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, where everything was good, but then things went wrong when sin entered into their world. And what was their reaction? What did they do? Well, ashamed and perhaps fearful because of their disobedience, they went into hiding. And God's response to that was very interesting. God went and he looked for them. He called out to them, where are you? Seeking once more relationship with them. Someone has written, sin and hiding are the fraternal twins of the fall of humanity. And you know, uh, sisters, brothers, it's an experience we're all familiar with. At some point in life, we've all run away from God and tried to hide from him because we have sinned. We've done something wrong in life. We're ashamed. We're perhaps fearful. But God doesn't want us to hide from him because of our sin. His response to us is the same as his response to Adam and Eve. He seeks to find us in order to offer us help, love and acceptance. <clears throat> One of the greatest examples of this comes in the story of Jesus and his meeting with Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. So what can we learn from this passage? Well, firstly, I want to remind you of this. Jesus came to find us. Jesus came to find us. Jesus was uh, on a mission. He was on his way to Jerusalem, where the cross awaited him. And as he travels along, he passes through this crowded city of Jericho. Uh, there are hundreds, thousands maybe, of people there awaiting him to see who he is. Hundreds of people clambering just to get a glance of him. And out of all those that were gathered there, Jesus cites and engages with this man called Zacchaeus, who we are told is a very wealthy tax collector. In ancient Israel, uh, tax collecting was deemed to be perhaps the worst occupation to, uh, to have. Tax collectors were the scum of the earth. Uh, society hated them for two reasons. Firstly, they worked for the occupying Roman forces. Um, so they were considered to be traitors of Israel. Secondly, they were nearly always greedy and dishonest men who creamed off the top and fleeced 
uh, their own people. The idea of a good tax collector was actually a contradiction in terms. So without doubt, uh, Zacchaeus would be deemed uh, a bad man, a bad apple, who was hated and despised by his community. He'd be on the very edge of society. We're not told much about this man, Zacchaeus, other than the fact that he was rich and verti vertically challenged. But when he hears that Jesus is coming to town, uh, he knows perhaps that Jesus has this reputation. Uh, his reputation would have gone ahead of him. And Jesus had this reputation of being friendly with tax collectors, prostitutes, and the other uh, undesirables, the unlovely uh, people of society and communities. And so Zacchaeus sets out to try and see Jesus. And I think that is emphasised here. He tries to see Jesus. It's very clear he just wants a glimpse of Jesus. There's no indication that Zacchaeus actually wants to reach out and meet with Jesus. He just wants to see him. And it's interesting, isn't it, that some folk today are exactly like that. They're perhaps intrigued by this man, Jesus. They've heard uh, things about him, that he's a good man, a miracle worker or whatever. Um, but somehow they hold back. They don't want to fully engage with Jesus. They just want to view him at a distance. Well, I wonder if that describes you. Do you want to stand at a distance and just observe Jesus? Well, for Zacchaeus and his desire to see Jesus, there's a bit of an issue there. Um, because the crowds are so huge and he's so very small. And because of that, and possibly, I think, because of the hostility of uh, the crowd towards Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus decides to climb this sycamore fig tree to try and uh, observe Jesus. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a sycamore fig tree, uh, but if you have, you'll know that the branches are strong, uh, that they're widespread, that they're distributed laterally, that there's a lot of foliage on them. And so it was easy uh, for Zacchaeus to climb this type of tree and to perhaps lay laterally uh, within the foliage to see Jesus uh, almost from a covert position. Zacchaeus is definitely curious about Jesus, wanting to see who he is. But I don't think he wanted Jesus to see him. Now, Comes, there then comes this big surprise because as Jesus is walking down the street he gets to the spot where Zacchaeus is and he stops one gets the impression he stops suddenly and he glances up into the tree and spots Zacchaeus and he says Zacchaeus come down immediately I must stay at your house today I mean imagine that Imagine the scene, Jesus walking along, suddenly and purposefully stopping and calling out a particular name. Zacchaeus may have been running, he may have been hiding, but now Jesus has found him. And I don't get the impression, in fact I'm certain that Jesus did not engage with Zacchaeus because he was concerned about his occupation or his reputation. Jesus was deeply concerned for Zacchaeus personally, concerned for his salvation, concerned about this man's future and he picks him out. That's why Jesus stopped and called Zacchaeus by name in particular. It's almost like Jesus was picking out the worst of the bunch simply to point out to the rest of the crowd that no one, 
No one is beyond the reach, the saving reach of our gracious and loving God. You know, I have a colleague, a chaplaincy colleague, who um, had a, a good friend who got into dire straits. His friend was heading down a path that would certainly lead to disaster. Time and time again, this friend had exploited others, including my chaplaincy colleague. He'd let folk down, including my chaplaincy colleague. He'd made false promises about changing his life and so on and so forth. His reputation was terrible. Things came to a head over a particular incident. And this chap went on the run, literally hiding because of his shame. Everybody turned their backs on this person, apart from my colleague. And my colleague did something which I think was quite extraordinary. You see, he was due to go on a family holiday, but he gave up his pre-booked leave uh, with his family and he set about on a mission to find his friend. His wife and children spent a couple of weeks in Wales. My colleague went to find, searching for this lost soul. And to cut a long story short, my colleague, at great personal cost, found the friend and managed to bring him back into the fold. And from that point, his life changed completely. I won't go in to the detail but if my colleague hadn't sought this boy out I have no doubt that that young man would have ended up in prison or even worse still he would have lost his life and you know this in a real sense is exactly what Jesus does for us what he did for us at great cost he set aside the glory and the majesty of heaven he laid aside his rights and privileges to try and find us in order to save us from disaster. Now perhaps as some of you hear this story about Zacchaeus today, you realise that instead of him, it's perhaps you that has fled and hid up a tree. Well, it's to you that I particularly and respectfully make a direct appeal today. Realise this, Jesus seeks you out right at this moment because he loves you. He wants to engender an intimate relationship with you. Or he wants to make your uh, relationship even more intimate. And if that applies to anyone listening right now, the response has to be the same as that of Zacchaeus. Quit hiding. Come down out of the tree and welcome Jesus into your life. You know, a response is absolutely crucial because the whole reason that Jesus came to find us is, and this is my second point, he came to forgive our sins. Jesus came to bring us forgiveness. And look, I, I remind you once more of the response that Zacchaeus made to Jesus at his appeal to come out of hiding. Zacchaeus, we are told, he came down from the tree at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. For me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, the crowd started to grumble, obviously. Uh, because Jesus had gone home with such a notorious individual. How dare he reach out to such a horrible, nasty, bad apple? The crowd knew that Zacchaeus was rotten to the core. But my hunch is that Zacchaeus realised this too. And what is more, um, I think that Zacchaeus, he was aware, perhaps at some deep uh, intuitive level that he had finally met the one and only person who could forgive his sinfulness, 
who could forgive his wrongdoing, who could help him deal with his catastrophic life and turn it around completely. That's what Jesus does. That's the work of God in the lives of ordinary, everyday human beings like you and me and Zacchaeus. What was true for Zacchaeus then is equally true for us now. Our sin, every aspect of it, every sin we've ever committed needs to be brought out of the tree as it were. It's no good trying to hide it. It needs to be opened up, revealed, exposed to the forgiving nature and power of Jesus Christ. Now I know that some of you don't like this kind of direct challenge. I hear the whispers and the rumours. Uh, it's all a bit too personal. Well, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to threaten you or make you feel awkward or uncomfortable. I'm trying to explain to you that the only one who can forgive the sin of humankind and heal us of our brokenness is the man Jesus, God the Son. And I want you, I want to encourage you to grasp the opportunity whilst you can to engage with Jesus and deal with that sin. Don't run away and go into hiding. That's not going to help. It wasn't long after this uh, mutual engagement between Jesus and Zacchaeus that Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus died on that cross for the sinfulness of Zacchaeus, the sinfulness of everyone in the crowd at Jericho and the sinfulness of me and you. What an incredible thing that Jesus did. I've heard some uh, quite astonishing stories of sacrifice, particularly in the context of war. And one such story is about a US Navy SEAL called Michael Monsua. Uh, what he did was, as I say, astonishing. Uh, during a firefight in uh, Ramadi in Iraq, um, he was, Michael Monsoor was the only one who saw this grenade fly in to um, uh, the, uh, the group that he was in, the unit he was in. And it landed, they were fighting from a rooftop and it, this grenade landed on the rooftop. And Monsoor was the only one to see it. His colleagues were oblivious to it. And what that man did was, having seen that live grenade, he threw himself onto it, protecting and saving those around him. He took the full impact of the explosion and he died of his injuries. Why did he do it? Who knows? Was it his training? Was it his love for his colleagues? You know, he was married with two young children. Well, for whatever reason he did it, he did it. But what is sure and certain is this. He died to save others. He sacrificed himself that they might live. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us, for humankind. He died so that we might live. He deals with the danger of sin in our lives. And sin is a dangerous thing. A Christian friend of mine in the Royal Navy is a pilot. Uh, his name is Phil and once um, he had to ditch the helicopter that he was flying into the sea. Um, the crew were safely abandoned. Um, so Phil kind of hovered and let them jump into the sea and then Phil flew the helicopter away at a safe distance from his colleagues in order to save them and he ditched the helicopter into the water. As he did that um, he went into a fully rehearsed and well practiced routine of escaping from a helicopter cab that is sinking in the water. He 
punched out a window from the cab. He released his harness, his seat harness, in order to swim away. And as he tried to swim away and escape through the window of the aircraft, he discovered he couldn't move. Uh, some part of his clothing uh, snagged, some part of his flight suit had snagged on something in the helicopter cab. I can't imagine what that moment was like as he felt himself being dragged down with the weight of the helicopter as it sank into the depths of the ocean. But what Phil did was he reached for a knife that he was carrying and he managed to cut away the part of his clothing that was snagged in the helicopter. And thankfully, he swam to safety. That's what sin does to us. It snags us up. It grabs a hold of us. It takes a hold of us. And it drags us down. And if it's not dealt with, we will drown in sin. It will overwhelm us. It will kill us. It will destroy us. And only Jesus can cut us free, as it were, from the clutches of sin. That's what he did for Zacchaeus. That's what he's done for us. And finally, I want to remind you of this. Jesus came to free us. As I've said, in the face of the uh, crowd's objections, Jesus visits the home of Zacchaeus. And what an impact that visit has. After that encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus is a changed man and he makes this unbelievable claim. He says he's going to give one half of his possessions to the poor and for anyone that he has defrauded, he will pay them back four times as much. Now this was an extremely generous act, but what prompted Zacchaeus to do that? Why does he do it? Well, Jesus provides us with the answer. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save what was lost. See, Zacchaeus was lost, but now he's been found. He was outside of salvation, but now he has entered into salvation. Jesus and the salvation he offers has changed this man. It has turned his life around and ultimately he set Zacchaeus on a new path, a path that leads to safety and eternal life. And ultimately this is what salvation is. It is freeing us up from the power of sin that ends in death for us. And releasing us, freeing us into a new life that is bound for heaven. Zacchaeus was trapped in a materialistic and corrupt life. He was hiding himself in his pursuit of wealth and possessions. It seems foolish, but perhaps he did this out of a legitimate desire for meaning, importance and security. Of course, the problem was that it started and uh, continued to control his life. And it caused him to damage others' lives and the life of himself. But when he's found by Jesus, and when he knows that he can be forgiven, he seems to be finally set free of these things that dominated his life. And suddenly he gives off his possessions away. And he pays back four times uh, the amount uh, that he is defrauded from those in his own community. It's a good thing when we're challenged with things like this in the Bible to ask ourselves, what is it? How does this apply to us? So we should say today, what is it that we are hiding in or from today? What's keeping us from becoming the people that God wants us to be? Is it the pursuit of riches and possessions? Or is it the quest for something far more culturally respectable? 
maybe achievements or accomplishments or something of that nature. Or maybe somebody feels like they're stuck with guilt hanging around their neck like a great heavy burden. And there's a lot of that uh, about, I think. Something that has gone wrong in the past, somewhere where you've messed up, but you're still there. Not able to forgive yourself. Unable to get free. And you blame yourself and you end up hiding from God and others and trying to hide that issue from God. Well, there's only one person with the power and the authority that can free you, free us from such things. And it is this extraordinary person called Jesus. He has come to find us. He has come to forgive us. He has come to free us, just like he did with Zacchaeus. There's the proof of the pudding. One of the most despicable traits, <clears throat> excuse me, in human history has been slavery. A human, uh, sorry, a huge amount of wealth and business was built upon the misery as, of slavery. It was and it still remains shameful. It is said that Abraham Lincoln, disgusted by the sight of slavery, once bought a slave girl at auction. The slave traders uh, brought her to him and dumped her at Lincoln's feet. At this, Lincoln reached down. He unlocked her chains and he said to her, Now you are free. She stared up at him with a bit of a quizzical look. And um, she said to him, What does it mean to be free? Lincoln responded, It means that you can think anything you want. You can say anything you want. You can go wherever you want. The reality of her new found freedom began to sink in. And with tears streaming down her cheeks, she looked at Lincoln and she said, Then I will go with you. In conclusion, that's what Jesus wants to do with us. He has come to find us. He has come to forgive us. He has come to free us from the power and penalty of sin. The question is, are we willing to let him do those things for us? And having let him do those things for us, are we then willing to go with him wherever he wants us to go. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus into this world to seek us out, to find us, to bring us forgiveness of sin and to free us to live the lives that God has truly uh, established for us and truly desires us to live. Help us to do that, we pray, in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. We are told that Zacchaeus was a man of short stature, but the thing that really stunted his growth was his greed. But what a change of heart as Jesus came into his home. Nick and I have been listening to a book by Andy Stanley called Enemies of the Heart, and in it he looks at four key things that really stunt our growth, one of them being greed. And he said the sneaky thing about greed is that it often shows itself to be something quite good. I'm actually saving all this money to be able to better provide for the future, to save my children from hardship. I'm buying all these things because we're supposed to enjoy life, aren't we? At what point do we start to say maybe some of what we've been given has been given to us to be able to bless other people? So that God's light might shine through us. How do we discern amongst all of the millions of needs that come at us? What Nick and I have set up over the years is this little set of priorities. Number one, God. In the Bible we're told to tithe. We're asked to do that in obedience to his word but also as a sign of our trust in him. A recognition that all that we have comes from him. And in our giving back of 10% of what he's given us, we're saying, I recognize that. I'm not going to cling to that. That's your money. You've asked for it, Lord, because you're asking for it to grow your kingdom. We want to give that back to you with joyful hearts, thanking you for all you've given us. And most of our lives, we've been able to tithe. 
There have been occasions though, when we have landed in difficulty and we've had to say, look, first and foremost, we need to pay the people that we owe because of whatever situation we're currently in. We've had circumstances where our family has landed in difficulty and they've needed money. And we've had to say, is the church all right at the moment? If we don't give that money there, and if that isn't a strong place, we've spoken to our church and said, actually, we're going to be giving that money to our family for the time being until they're up on their feet. There've been times where we've had more than enough. We've been able to give to the church and we've been able to help and support other people in need. There've been times where we haven't really needed much, neither have our family. And we've been able to look to the wider world and to say, what's going on there? To be honest, it's not always as neat as that. Needs come at us all the time. And sometimes we have to just sit down and pray and say, Lord, won't you help us to understand what it is that you want us to do with this money for you in the world right now? So those decisions are not for us to make alone. They're meant to be made in partnership with God because the generosity that is shown in giving is meant to be him <laughs> shining through us not just us being nice people. Let's pray. Lord, where we have grabbed and taken for ourselves, would you forgive us? We look at Zacchaeus and how eager he was to give back to those from whom he had taken. And also to go a step further and bless those who desperately need it. And Lord, we would want to open our hands to you today and say, Lord, here is all that I have all that I am. Would you take it, show me how best to use it, where to spend it, that your name would be honored, that your kingdom would be experienced, and that your glory would shine all the brighter for people to see. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.